I asked. Jushi said that the phrase, in loving the people, Qin Nin, in the great learning, should read, in renovating the people, Qin Nin, since in a later section of the book it says, arouse the people to become new, he seems to have some evidence for his contention. Do you also have evidence for believing that the phrase and loving the people in the old text should be followed? The teacher said, the word sheen and the phrase arouse the people to become new means the people but does not mean the same. The passages that follow in the text on bringing order to the state and peace to the world do not amplify the meaning of renovation. On the contrary, these passages in the text, rulers deem worthy what they deemed worthy and loved what they loved, while the common people enjoyed what they enjoyed and benefited from their beneficial arrangements. Act as if you were watching over an infant, and the ruler likes what people like and dislikes what people dislike. That is what is meant by being a parent of the people. All express the meaning of love. The meaning of loving the people is the same as in Mencius' saying, the superior man is affectionate to his parents and humane to all people. To love is the same as to be humane, because the common people did not love one another, and Bershun appointed Che to be minister of education and to institute with great seriousness the five teachings. This was Emperor Shun's way to love the people. The sentence, he was able to manifest his lofty character, means the same as manifesting the clear character, and the statements there to love the nine classes of his kindred, to have harmony and to have unity and accord, mean the same as loving the people and manifesting the clear character to the world. Also, Confucius said, the superior man cultivates himself so as to give the common people security and peace. Cultivating oneself means manifesting the clear character and giving the common people security and peace means loving the people. Reading the phrase as loving the people expresses both the ideas of educating and feeding the people. Reading it to mean renovating the people, however, seems to be one-sided. I said, with reference to the sentence, only after knowing what to abide in can one be calm in the great learning. Jushi considered that all events and things possess in them a definite principle. This seems to contradict your theory. The teacher said, To seek the highest good, the abiding point in individual events and things, is to regard righteousness as external. The highest good is the original substance of the mind. It is no other than manifesting one's clear character to the point of refinement and singleness of mind, and yet it is not separated from events and things. When Jushi said in his commentary that manifesting the clear character is the realization of the principle of nature to the fullest extent without an iota of selfish human desire, he got the point. I said, if the highest good is to be sought only in the mind, I am afraid not all principles of things in the world will be covered. The teacher said, the mind is principle. Is there any affair in the world outside of the mind? Is there any principle outside of the mind? I said, in filial piety, in serving one's parents, in loyalty, in serving one's ruler, in faithfulness, in intercourse with friends, or in humanity, in governing the people, there are many principles which I believe should not be left unexamined. The teacher said with a sigh, This idea has been obscuring the understanding of people for a long time. Can they be awakened by one word? However, I shall comment along the line of your question. For instance, in the matter of serving one's parents, one cannot seek for the principle of filial piety in the parent. In serving one's ruler, one cannot seek for the principle of loyalty in the ruler. In the intercourse with friends and in governing the people, one cannot seek for the principles of faithfulness and humanity in friends and the people. They are all in the mind. That is all. 
for the mind and principle are identical. When the mind is free from the obscuration of selfish desires, it is the embodiment of the principle of nature, which requires not an iota added from the outside. When this mind, which has become completely identical with the principle of nature, is applied and arises to serve parents, there is filial piety. When it arises to serve the ruler, there is loyalty. When it arises to deal with friends or to govern the people, there is faithfulness and humanity. The main thing is for the mind to make an effort to get rid of selfish human desires and preserve the principle of nature. I said, having heard what you said, sir, I begin to understand. However, the old theory still lingers in my mind, from which I cannot entirely get away. Take, for example, the matter of serving one's parents. The filial son is to care for their comfort both in winter and summer, and to inquire after their health every morning and evening. These things involve many actual details. Should we not endeavor to investigate them? The teacher said, Why not inve endeavor to investigate them? The main thing is to have a basis. The main thing is to endeavor to investigate them by ridding the mind of selfish human desires and preserving the principle of nature. For instance, to investigate the provision of warmth for parents in the winter is none other than the extension of the filial piety of this mind to the utmost, for fear that a trifle of human selfish desires might creep in, and to investigate the provision of coolness for parents in the summer is none other than the extension of the filial piety of this mind to the utmost, for fear that a trifle of selfish human desires might creep in. It is merely to investigate this mind. If the mind is free from selfish human desires and has become completely identical with the principle of nature, and if it is the mind that is sincere in its filial piety to parents, then in the winter it will naturally think of the cold of parents and seek a way to provide warmth for them. In the summer it will naturally think of the heat of parents and seek a way to provide coolness for them. These are all offshoots of the mind that is sincere in its filial piety. Nevertheless, there must be first be such a mind before there can be these offshoots. Compared to the tree, the mind with sincere filial piety is the root, whereas the offshoots are the leaves and branches. There must first be roots before there can be leaves and branches. One does not seek to find leaves and branches and then cultivate the root. The Book of Rights says a filial son who loves his parents deeply is sure to have a peaceful disposition. Having a peaceful disposition, he will surely have a happy expression, and having a happy expression, he will surely have a pleasant countenance. There must be deep love as the root, and then the rest will naturally follow like this. Chang Chao Shuo said, in some cases the highest good must be sought in events and things. The teacher said, the highest good is none other than the mind which has completely identified with the principle of nature in its fullest extent. What is the need for seeking it in things and events? Suppose you cite some instances. Chao Shuo said, Take serving parents, what the details in providing warmth or coolness for them are, and what the proper ways of supporting them are, must be investigated and the correct answers found. Only then will the highest good be achieved. This is why the effort to study extensively, to inquire accurately, to think carefully, and to sift clearly is necessary. The teacher said, If it were only the details of providing warmth or coolness or the proper way of support, they can be entirely discussed in a day or two. What is the need to study, inquire, think, and sift? However, in order for the mind to be completely identified with the principle of nature in its fullest extent, in providing parents with warmth or coolness or when supporting them, there must be this effort to learn, ask, think, and sift. Otherwise, an infinitesimal mistake in the beginning will lead to an infinite error at the end. This is why even a sage needs the teachings of refinement and singleness of mind. If the highest good means no more than having the details correct, then dressing like an actor and acting out these details correctly on the stage would be called the highest good. I gain further understanding on that day. I did not understand the teacher's doctrine of the unity of knowledge and action and debated it back and forth with Huang, Tsung, Xie, and Ku Wei Xian without coming to any conclusion. Therefore, I took the matter to the teacher, and the teacher said, 
give an example and let me see. I said, for example, there are people who know that parents should be served with filial piety and elder brothers with respect, but cannot put these things into practice. This shows that knowledge and action are clearly two different things. The teacher said, the knowledge and action you refer to are already separated by selfish desires and are no longer knowledge and action in their original substance. There have never been people who know but do not act. Those who are supposed to know but do not act simply do not yet know. When sages and worthies taught people about knowledge and action, it was precisely because they wanted them to restore the original substance and not simply to do this or that and be satisfied. Therefore, the great learning points to true knowledge and action for people to see, saying, they are like loving beautiful colors and hating bad odors. Seeing beautiful colors appertains to knowledge while loving beautiful colors appertains to action. However, as soon as one sees that beautiful color, he has already loved it. It is not that he sees it first and then makes up his mind to love it. Smelling a bad odor appertains to knowledge, while hating a bad odor appertains to action. However, as soon as one smells a bad odor, he has already hated it. It is not that he smells it first and then makes up his mind to hate it. A person with his nose stuffed up does not smell the bad odor even if he sees a odorous object before him, and so he does not hate it. This accounts to not knowing bad odor. Suppose we say that so-and-so knows filial piety and so-and-so knows brotherly respect. They must have actually practiced filial piety and brother respect before they can be said to know them. It will not do to say that they know filial piety and brotherly respect simply because they show them in words or take one's knowledge of pain. Only after one has experienced pain can one know pain. The same is true of cold or hunger. How can knowledge and action be separated? This is the original substance of knowledge and action, which have not been separated by selfish desires. In teaching people, the sage insisted that only this can be called knowledge, otherwise this is not yet knowledge. This is serious and practical business. What is the objective of desperately insisting on knowledge and action being two different things, and what is the objective of my insisting that they are one? What is the use of insisting on their being one or two unless one knows the basic purpose of their doctrine, of the doctrine? I said, in saying that knowledge and action are two different things, the ancients intended to have people distinguish and understand them, so that, on the one hand, they make an effort to know, and, on the other, make an effort to act, and only then can the effort find any solution. The teacher said, this is to lose sight of the basic purpose of the ancients. I have said that knowledge is the direction for action, and action the effort of knowledge, and that knowledge is the beginning of action, and action the completion of knowledge. If this is understood, then when one knowledge, when only knowledge is mentioned, action is included, and when only action is mentioned, Knowledge is included. The reason why the ancients talked about knowledge and action separately is that there are people in the world who are confused and act on impulse without any sense of deliberation or self-examination, and who thus only behave blindly and erroneously. Therefore, it is necessary to talk about knowledge to them before their action becomes correct. There are also those who are intellectually vague and undisciplined and think in a vacuum, they are not at all willing to make the effort of concrete practice. They only pursue shadows and echoes, as it were. It is therefore necessary to talk about action to them before their knowledge becomes true. The ancient teachers could not help talking this way in order to restore balance and avoid any defect. If we understand this motive, then a single word, either knowledge or action, will do. But people today distinguish between knowledge and action and pursue them separately, believing that one must know before he can act. They will discuss and learn the business of knowledge first, they say, and wait till they truly know before they put their knowledge into practice. Consequently, at the last day of life, 
they will never act and also will never know. This doctrine of knowledge first and action later is not a mere a minor disease, and it did not come about only yesterday. My present advocacy of the unity of knowledge and action is precisely the medicine for that disease. The doctrine is not my baseless imagination, for it is the original substance of knowledge and action that they are one. Now that we know this basic purpose, it will do no harm to talk about them separately, for they are only one. If the basic purpose is not understood, however, even if we say they are one, what is the use? It's just idle talk. I said, yesterday when I heard your teaching about abiding in the highest good, I realized I had some grasp of this task, but I still feel that your teaching does not agree with Vichy's doctrine of the investigation of things. Nietzsche said, the investigation of things is the work of abiding in the highest good. Once we know what the highest good is, we know how to investigate things. I said, yesterday when I examined Jushi's doctrine of the investigation of things in the light of your teaching, I seem to understand it in general, but I am still not clear in my mind because Jushi's doctrine, after all, has the support of what is called refineness and singleness of mind in the book of history, extensive study of literature and self-restraint by the rules of propriety and in the Analects and exerting one's mind to the utmost and knowing one's nature in the book of Mencius. The teacher said, Zisha, 507, 420 BC, had strong faith in the sage, whereas Sung Tzu, 505 to 436 BC, turned to seek the highest good in himself. It is good to have strong faith, of course, but it is not as real and concrete as seeking in oneself. Since you have not understood this idea, why should you cling to Jushi's old tradition and not seek what is right? Even with Jushi, while he respected and believed in Master Chang Yi, he would not carelessly follow him whenever he came to something he could not understand. The teachings of refinement and singleness, extensive study and self-restraint, and exerting the mind to the utmost are basically harmonious with my doctrine. Only you have not thought about it. Jushi's teaching on the investigation of things is forced, arbitrary, and far-fetched, and is not what the investigation of things originally meant. Refinement is the work of achieving singleness and extensive study, the work of achieving restraint. Since you already understand the principle of the unity of knowledge and action, this can be explained in one word. As to exerting one's mind to the utmost, knowing one's nature, and knowing heaven, these are the acts of those who are born with such knowledge and practice it naturally and easily. Preserving the mind, nourishing one's nature, and serving heaven are the acts of those who learn them through study and practice them for their advantage. To maintain one's single-mindedness regardless of longevity or brevity of life, and to cultivate one's personal life while waiting for fate to take its own course are the acts of those who learn through hard work and practice them with effort and difficulty. But Jushi wrongly interpreted the doctrine of the investigation of things because he reversed the above order and thought that the higher attainments of exerting one's mind to the utmost and knowing one's nature are equivalent to the investigation of things and the extension of knowledge. He required the beginner to perform the acts of those who are born to know and who practice naturally and easily. How can that be done? I asked, why are exerting the mind to the utmost and knowing one's nature the acts of those who are born to know and who practice naturally and easily? The teacher said, our nature is the substance of the mind and heaven is the source of our nature. To exert one's mind to the utmost is the same as fully developing one's nature. Only those who are absolutely sincere can fully develop their nature and know the transforming and nourishing process of heaven and earth. Those who merely preserve their minds, on the other hand, have not yet exerted them to the utmost. Knowing heaven is the same as knowing the affairs of a district or a county, which is what the titles prefect and magistrate mean. It is a matter within one's own function, and it means that one in his moral character has already become one with heaven. 
Serving heaven, on the other hand, is like the serving of the parents by the son and the serving of the ruler by the minister. It must be done seriously and reverently to please them, if it is to be perfect. Even then, one is still separated from heaven. This is the difference between a sage who exerts the mind to the utmost and knows heaven, and the worthies who preserve their minds and serve heaven. As to allowing no double-mindedness regardless of longevity or brevity of life, it is to teach the student to do good with single-mindedness and not to f allow success or failure, longevity or brevity of life to shake his determination to do good, but instead to cultivate his personal life and wait for fate to take its own course, realizing that success and failure or longevity and brevity of life are matters of fate and one need not unnecessarily allow them to disturb his mind. Although those who serve heaven are separated from heaven, they nevertheless already see heaven right in front of them. Waiting for fate to take its own course, however, means that one has not yet seen heaven but is still waiting for it, so to speak. It is the beginner's first step in making up his mind, involving a certain amount of effort and difficulty, but Jushi reversed the order so that the student has no place to start. I said, Yesterday when I heard your teaching, I vaguely realized that one's effort must follow this procedure. Now that I have heard what you said, I have no further doubt. Last night I came to the conclusion that the word thing, who, in the phrase, the investigation of things, ko, ko wu, has the same meaning as the word event, sure, both referring to the mind. The teacher said, correct, the master of the body is the mind. What emanates from the mind is the will, the original substance of the will is knowledge, and wherever the will is directed is a thing. For example, when the will is directed toward serving one's parents, then serving one's parents is a thing. When the will is directed toward serving one's ruler, then serving one's ruler is a thing. When the will is directed toward being humane to all people and feeling love toward things, then being humane to all people and feeling love toward things are things. And when the will is directed toward seeing, hearing, speaking, and acting, then each of these is a thing. Therefore I say that there are neither principles nor things outside of the mind. The teaching in the doctrine of the mean that without sincerity there would be nothing, and the effort to manifest one's clear character described in the great learning mean nothing more than the effort to make the will sincere. And the work of making the will sincere is none other than the investigation of things. The teacher further said, the word ko and ko wu is the same as the ko Mencius's saying that a great man rectified ko, the ruler's mind. It means to eliminate what is incorrect in the mind so as to preserve the correctness of its original substance. Wherever the will is, the incorrectness must be eliminated so correctness may be preserved. In other words, in all places and at all times, the principle of nature must be preserved. This is the investigation of principles to the utmost. The principle of nature is clear character, and to investigate the principle of things to the utmost is to manifest the clear character. He further said, knowledge is the original substance of the mind. The mind is naturally able to know. When it perceives the parents, it naturally knows that one should be filial. When it perceives the older brother, it naturally knows that one should be respectful. When it perceives a child falling into a well, it naturally knows that one should be commiserative. This is innate knowledge of good, beyonder, and need not be sought outside. If what emanates from innate knowledge is not obstructed by selfish ideas, the result will be like the saying, if a man gives full development to his feeling of commiseration, his humanity will be more than he can ever put into practice. However, the ordinary man is not free from the obstruction of selfish ideas. It therefore requires the effort of the extension of knowledge and the investigation of things in order to overcome selfish ideas and restore principle. Then the mind's faculty of innate knowledge will no longer be obstructed, but will be able to penetrate and operate everywhere. One's knowledge will then be extended. With knowledge extended, one's will becomes sincere. I said, 
to regard the extensive study of literature when as the work of restraining oneself with rules of propriety. I have thought over the matter carefully and have not been able to understand. Kindly enlighten me. The teacher said, the word li, meaning propriety, ceremonies, means the same as li, meaning principle. When principles become manifested and can be seen, we call them patterns. When also meaning literature, and when patterns are hidden and abstruse and cannot be seen, we call them the principle. They are the same thing. Restraining oneself with the rules of propriety means that this mind must become completely identified with the principle of nature. In order to become completely identified with the principle of nature, one must direct one's effort to wherever principle is manifested. For example, if principle is manifested in serving of the parents, one should learn to preserve it in the very act of serving one's parents. If principle is manifested in the serving of one's ruler, one should learn to preserve it in the very act of serving one's ruler. If principle is manifested in living in riches or poverty or in noble or humble station, one should learn to preserve it in these situations. And if principle is manifested in one's being in difficulty and danger or being in the midst of barbarous tribes, one should learn to preserve it in these situations. And one should do the same whether working or resting, speaking or silent. No matter where principle may be manifested, one should learn right then and there to preserve it. This is what is meant by the extensive study of literature. This is the work of restraining oneself with the rules of propriety. To study literature extensively means to be refined in one's mind and to restrain oneself with the rules of propriety means to have singleness in one's mind. I said, the moral mind is always the master of the person, and the human mind always obeys the moral mind. When examined in the light of your teaching of refinement and singleness of mind, these words seem to be wrong. The teacher said, right, there is only one mind. Before it is mixed with selfish human desires, it is called the moral mind, and after it is mixed with human desires contrary to its natural state, it is called the human mind. When the human mind is rectified, it is called the moral mind, and when the moral mind loses its correctness, it is called the human mind. There were not two minds to start with. The master, Xiong Yi, said that the human mind is due to selfish desires, while the moral mind is due to the principle of nature. It sounds like dividing the mind into two, but his idea is really correct. But to say that the moral mind is the master and the human mind obeys it, is to say that there are two minds. The principle of nature and selfish human desires cannot coexist. How can there be the principle of nature as the master and at the same time selfish human desires to obey it? I asked about Wang Tang when Zhang Zi, 584-617, and Han Yu, 768-824. The teacher said Han Yu was only a giant among literary men, whereas Wang Tang was a worthy scholar. People have glorified Han Yu only because of his literary accomplishment, but he was really far, far inferior to Wang Tang. I asked, why did Wang Tang make the mistake of imitating the classics? The teacher said, I'm afraid imitating the classics should not be totally condemned. Suppose you state the difference in objectives between Wang Tang's imitating the classics and the writings of later scholars. I said, there have been scholars who wrote with an eye on reputation, but their main purpose was to eliminate the doctrine, whereas imitating the classics seems to be entirely for the sake of reputation. The teacher said, whom have they followed in writing to illuminate the doctrine? I said, Confucius abridged and transmitted the six classics for the purpose of illuminating the doctrine. The teacher said, isn't imitating the classics also following Confucius? I said, the scholar's writings contributed something to illuminate the doctrine, but I'm afraid Wang Tung's imitation of the classics merely seems to imitate the external manifestations without adding anything to the doctrine. The teacher said, by illuminating the doctrine, do you mean returning to simplicity and purity and revealing them in concrete practice or in or writing flowery speeches aimed at making noise and creating argument. 
The great disorder of the world is due to the popularity of conventional, meaningless literature and the decline of actual practice of moral values. If the doctrine had been illuminated throughout the world, there would have been no need to transmit the six classics. Confucius abridged and transmitted them only because he had to. From the time of Fuxi, who devised the eight trigrams, to the time of King Wen, 1171 to 1122 BC, and Duke Zhou, 1094 BC, a countless number of books such as the Lian Shan and the Kui Zhang mountain range reservoir was written on the doctrine of changes, and consequently the doctrine of changes became highly confused, believing that the atmosphere of superficial writing was becoming thicker and realizing that there would be no end to theorizing. Confucius took hold of the do- doctrine of King Wen and Duke Zhou and clarified it as the only way of getting at its foundation. As a result, the various theories were all overthrown and a unanimity of interpretation was reached among the expositors of the Book of Changes. Unanimity. It was the same with the case of cases of the Book of Books of History, Odes, Rites, and Music in the Spring and Autumn Annals, following the first four chapters of the Book of History and the first two books of the Book of Odes. There have been thousands of such as the Pa Su, Eight Inquiries, and the Cho Cho, Nine Months, and all those licentious verses, names, varieties, and systems of ceremonies and music, too, became innumerable. Confucius edited, made deletions, and put them all in order, and only then were the speculative theories overthrown. He did not add a word to the books of history, odes, rites, and music. The various doctrines contained in the present book of rites all consist of far-fetched interpretations of later scholars and not of Confucius' original teachings. As to the spring and autumn annals, although it is supposed to have been written by Confucius, actually it is the original text of the history of Lu. What is meant by Confucius' writing down is that he wrote down the original, and what is meant by his eliminating is that he eliminated the superfluous. Thus, what he did was to reduce, but not to add. When Confucius transmitted the six classics, he feared that superfluous writing was creating a chaos in the world, and he had no time in making the classic simple so that people might avoid the superfluous words and find out the real meaning. He did not intend to teach through mere words. After the Trinchou period, 722-41 BC, super, superfluous yeah, writing became more abundant and the world became more chaotic. The first emperor of Qin, 246-210 BC, burned the books and has been condemned because he did so from a selfish motive and he should not have burned the six classics. Had his intention been to illuminate the doctrine and to burn all those books opposed to the classics and violating principle, it would have conformed by implication to Confucius' intention of editing and transmitting the classics. From the time of Chen and Han, 206 BC AD 220, literary productions daily increased in number. It would be impossible to discard all of them even if we wanted to, One should only follow the example of Confucius by recording those that are approximately correct and making them known. The various perverse doctrines will then gradually disappear by themselves. I do not know what Wang Tung's purpose was when he imitated the classics, but I rather strongly approve it, believing that if Confucius had lived again, he would not have done otherwise. The reason the world is not in order is because superficial writing is growing and concrete practice is declining. People advance their own opinions, valuing what is novel and strange, in order to mislead the common folks and gain fame. 
they merely confuse people's intelligence and dull people's senses so that people devout, devote much of their time and energy to competing in conventional writing and flowery composition in order to achieve fame. They no longer remember that there are such deeds as honoring the fundamental, valuing truth, and returning to simplicity and purity. All this trouble was started by those who wrote extensively and superficially. I said, some writing is perhaps indispensable, for example, in the case of the spring and autumn annals. If there were not the writing, the so fun, so is commentary, I'm afraid it would be difficult to understand. The teacher said, to say that the spring and autumn annals can only be illuminated with the commentary is to regard it as a puzzle within the last part left out. Why should Confucius write in such difficult and abstruse terms? Much of the Tuan is from the original text of the history of Lu. If the spring and autumn annals depends on it to be understood, then why should Confucius have abridged it? I said, Chang Yi said, the commentary contains cases, the classic contains judgments. For example, in the spring and autumn annals, it is recorded that so-and-so murdered his ruler or such-and-such -such a feudal lord invaded such-and-such -a, -such a state. It would be difficult to judge unless the facts supplied by the commentary are known. The teacher said, Yi Chuan probably repeated what famous but mediocre scholars had said. He did not appreciate Confucius' purpose in writing the spring and autumn annals. When he recorded that so-and-so murdered his ruler, the murder in itself was a crime. What is the need of inquiring into its details? Military expeditions against the feudal state should proceed from the king. When he recorded that such and such a feudal lord invaded a state, the invasion in itself was a crime. What is the need of inquiring into its details? The primary purpose of Confucius' transmitting the six classics was purely to rectify people's minds, to preserve the principle of nature, and to illuminate selfish human desires. He did discuss these matters. Sometimes when people asked him, he would talk to them according to their capacity to understand. But even then, he would not talk much, for he was afraid that people would try to seek truth in words only. This is why he said, I do not wish to say anything. How could he be willing to tell people in detail all these things that would release selfish human desires and destroy the principle of nature? That would be to promote disorder and induce wickedness. This is the reason Mencius said, None of Confucius's pupils spoke about the affairs of the despots, Duke Huan, 685-643 BC, and Duke Wen, 636-628 BC, and therefore they have not been transmitted to posterity. This is the special and private way of the Confucian school. Famous but mediocre scholars of today talk only about the type of learning suitable for a despot. Therefore, they want to learn all kinds of secret and crafty schemes. Their objective is purely success and profit, an aim diametrically opposed to the sage's purpose in writing the classic. How can they understand? Thereupon the teacher sighed and added, It is not easy to talk about this thing with people except those who understand the character of heaven. The teacher further said, Confucius said, When I was young, a historian would still leave something unsaid. And Mencius said, It would be better to have no book of history than to believe all of it. In the completion of war section, I accept only two or three passages. In abridging the book, Confucius retained only a few chapters to cover the four or five odd centuries of the Tang, Yu, and Sha periods. Weren't there any more events to record? The fact that he confined himself to what he did ought to show us his intention. He merely wanted to eliminate superfluous writing. On the contrary, later scholars have only wanted to add. I said, when Confucius produced the classics, he merely wanted to get rid of selfish human desires and preserve the principle of nature, and did not want to tell people in detail about affairs from the time of the five despots down. 
It is true enough, but why should he have been so brief about the events before Yao and Chun? And the teacher said, In the period of Fuxi and the Yellow Emperor, events were few and far between. None of them have been transmitted to us. Nevertheless, we can imagine that at that time life was perfectly pure, lofty, simple, and plain, without any air of being ornamental. This is the peace and order of great antiquity, not to be matched by later ages. I said histories like those of Fuxi, Shennong, and the Yellow Emperor have been handed down. Why did Confucius discard them? The teacher said, even if it was true that there were such histories, they would not be good for later ages which have gradually undergone change. As customs and manners became complicated, ornament and embellishment became more prevalent. Even by the end of the Zhou, 1111 to 256 BC, it was impossible to reinstate the customs of Sha, 2183 to 1752 BC, and Shang, 1751 to 1112 BC times, let alone the times of Yao and Shun and the times of Fuxi and the Yellow Emperor, which were further back. However, while their governments were different, the principle is the same with them all. Consequently, Confucius transmitted the doctrines originally handed down by Yao and Shun and adopted and promoted as a model the social and religious laws of King Wen and King Wu, 1211-1116 BC. These regulations, in essence, were no different from the principles of Yao and Shun. But because government had to be adjusted to the times, governmental measures and institutions naturally were different. Even the undertakings of the Shah and the Shang would not be applicable to the Zhou. For this reason, Duke Zhou, wanting to combine the good works of the founders of the Shah and Shang and the Zhou, I guess Zhou, Zhou, found certain things inapplicable and had to think hard day and night to make the adjustment. How much more difficult would it be to reinstate the governments of high antiquity? Naturally, Confucius reduced its record to the minimum. The teacher further said, Merely to engage in taking no action, to be unable to adjust the government according to the time, as did the three kings, and to insist on practicing the customs of high antiquity is the way of Buddhist and Taoist learning. To adjust the government according to the times, but not to be able to base it on the principle handed down by Yao and Shun, as the three kings did, and instead to exercise government with the motive of success and profit is the enterprise of the despots and those since them. Later scholars have talked and talked and talked, but all they have talked about is the technique of despotism. The teacher further said, the governmental systems before the times of Yao and Shun cannot be reinstated in later ages. They should be ignored. The government after the three dynasties, Sha, Shang, Cho, is not worth following. The record should be abridged. Only the governments of the three dynasties are practicable. Unfortunately, people who discuss the three dynasties do not understand the fundamental and merely concern themselves with the secondary, and consequently that system cannot be restored either. I said, Former scholars said that among the six classics, the spring and autumn annals is history. Since history is purely to record events, I am afraid that in the final analysis it is somewhat different in form and content from the other five classics. The teacher said, a history deals with events while a classic deals with principles. However, events are really principles and principles are really events. Thus, the spring and autumn annals also is a classic, while the other five classics are also histories. The book of changes is the history of Fuxi. The book of history is the history of the period from the time of Yao and Shun on, and the books of rites and music are the histories of the three dynasties. And as much as the events and principles discussed in these classics are the same, is there anything wherein that can be said to be different? The teacher further said, The five classics are also history, and no more. The principle of history is to distinguish good and evil, and to give instructions to do good and warnings against evil. The classics can retain those facts that are good and useful for instruction in order to serve as models for us. As to the facts that are evil but can serve as a warning, as warning, they retain the warning but eliminate the facts so as to prevent wickedness. I said, 
To retain the facts in order to show us the model is, of course, a way of preserving the principle of nature as it originally is. An elimination of the facts to prevent wickedness likewise is elimination of the facts to prevent wickedness likewise a way of suppressing selfish desires when they are about to be aroused. The teacher said, this is of course the purpose of the sage in producing the classics. However, one should not take the records too literally. I further ask, if in the case of those evil events that can be taken as warning, the classics retain the warning but eliminate the facts in order to prevent wickedness, why in the case of the Book of Odes does alone in the Book of Odes alone have the, oh, the licentious parts of the Odes of the states of Chang and Wei not be expunged. A former scholar said evil can serve to correct one's indolence. Is that correct? The teacher said the Book of Odes is not the original work of the Confucian school. Confucius said banish the songs of Chang, they are licentious, and again said I hate the way in which the songs of Chang confound the classical songs. The songs of Chang and Wei are songs of declining states. This is the position of the Confucian school. The 300 odes selected by Confucius were all classical. They were all qualified to be sung in sacrifices to heaven and imperial ancestors as well as in community rites. They were all intended to promote peace and cultivate virtue. For the sake of social reform, should the songs of Chang and Wei be tolerated? To tolerate them would be to pronounce to promote lewdness and induce wickedness. Most certainly after the burning of books by the Chen, famous but mediocre scholars arbitrarily added these songs of Chang and Wei to the classic in order to make up 300 odes. For among the popular masses, most people enjoy singing licentious songs. You can hear them in every valley, every alley. <clears throat> to say that evil can serve to correct one's indolence is to make an excuse after having failed to find a satisfactory explanation. I asked, with reference to the effort of concentrating on the one thing, suppose in reading books one's mind is concentrated on reading books and in entertaining guests one's mind is concentrated on entertaining them, can these be regarded as con concentrating on one thing? The teacher said, suppose in loving sex one's mind is concentrated on loving sex and in loving money one's mind is concentrated on loving money, can these be regarded as concentrating on one thing? These are not concentrating on one thing. They are chasing after material things. Concentrating on one thing means the absolute concentration of the mind on the principle of nature. I asked about making up the mind. The teacher said, it is simply the resolution in every thought to preserve the principle of nature. If one does not neglect this, in due time, it will crystallize in one's mind and become what the Taoists call the mystical conception of a sage. If the thought of the principle of nature is always retained, then the gradual steps to the levels of the beautiful man, the great man, the sage, and the spirit man are all but the cultivation and extension of this one thought. The teacher said, if during the day one feels work becoming annoying, one should sit in meditation, but if one feels lazy and not inclined to read, then he should go ahead and read. To do this is like applying medicine according to the disease. The teacher said, friends in dealing with each other should try to be humble toward one another, for that will benefit them. If they try to be superior to each other, it will hurt them. Meng Yuan has the defects of regarding himself as always right and of loving fame. The teacher has admonished him many times. One day, just after such an admonition, a friend of his told the teacher of his recent efforts and asked for correction. Standing by the side of the teacher, Yuan said, What he has found is my old stuff. The teacher said, Your defect comes up again. Yuan's face paled and he was about to argue. The teacher said, your defect comes up again, and he went on to teach him, saying, This is the root of the great trouble of your whole life. Suppose you plant this big tree in a square. The nutrition from rain and the energy from the soil are barely sufficient to support it. If you want to plant some good grains around it, they will be covered by its branches above and wrapped up by its roots below. How can they grow? The tree must be removed, leaving not even a tender root before good grains can be planted. Otherwise, 
No matter how much you cultivate them and enrich the soil, all the nourishment will go to this tree. I said, Scholars of later generations have written a great deal. I am afraid some of it has confounded correct learning. And the teacher said, The human mind and the principle of nature are undifferentiated. Sages and worthies wrote about them very much like a portrait painter, painting the true likeness and transmitting the spirit. He shows only an outline of the appearance to serve as the basis for people to seek and find the true personality. Among one spirit, feelings, expressions, and behavior, there is that which cannot be transmitted. Later writers have imitated and copied what the sages have drawn. They have erroneously mutilated it and have added to it their own way in order to show off their own tricks. In this way, the original is further and further lost. I asked, a sage's response to changing conditions is unlimited. Does he have to study beforehand? The teacher said, How can he study everything? The mind of the sage is like a clear mirror. Since it is all clarity, it responds to all stimuli as they come and reflects everything. There is no such case as a previous image still remaining in the present reflection or a yet-to-be-reflected image already existing there. Scholars of later generations propagate such a doctrine and therefore they have greatly violated the teachings of the sage. Duke Cho instituted ceremonies and established musical systems to provide the world with a the culture. These are things that all sages are capable of doing. Why didn't Yao and Shun do all of them instead of leaving them to Duke Cho? Confucius edited and transmitted the six classics as guidance for 10,000 generations. This is also a thing that any sage can do. Why didn't Duke Cho do it? instead of leaving it for Confucius. From these we know that a sage does a thing when the time comes. The only fear is that the mirror is not clear, not that it is incapable of reflecting a thing as it comes. The study of changing conditions and events is to be done at the time of response. However, a student must be engaged in brightening up the mirror. He should worry only about his mind's not being clear and not about the inability to respond to all changing conditions. I said, if so, how about the saying, empty, tranquil, and without any sign, and yet all things are luxuriantly present? The teacher said, this theory is fundamentally good, but if it is not understood correctly, there will be trouble. The teacher said, Moral principles exist in no fixed place and are not exhaustible. Please do not think that when you have gotten something from conversations with me, that is all there is to it. There will be no end if we talk for 10, 20, or 50 more years. Some days later, he said again, Emperors Yao and Shun were the height of sageness, and yet goodness goes beyond them indefinitely. Kings Che 1802 to 1752 BC and Cho 1175 to 1112 BC represented the height of evil and yet evil goes beyond them indefinitely. If Che and Cho had not died when they died, would their wickedness be limited to what it actually was? If there is a limit to goodness, how is it that even Sage King Wen looked for the way as if he could not see it? I said, only feelings seem to be all right when one is quiet. However, when something happens, they become different. Why is it? The teacher said, This is because one only knows how to cultivate oneself in quietness and does not exert effort to master oneself. Consequently, when something happens, one turns topsy-turvy. One must be trained and polished in the actual affairs of life. Only then can one stand firm and remain calm, whether in activity or in tranquility. I asked about the way of penetrating on the higher transcendental level. The teacher said, In their way of teaching people, as soon as they got to anything refined or subtle, scholars of later generations say that it belongs to penetrating on the higher level and should not be pursued, and that it is better to turn to studies on the lower empirical level. This is to separate the two levels. Now what the eye can see, what the ear can hear, what the mouth can say, 
and what the mind can think are all matters of learning on the lower level, whereas what the eye cannot see, what the ear cannot hear, what the mouth cannot say, and what the mind cannot think of are matters of penetration on the higher level. For example, providing a tree with care and water is learning on the lower level, whereas the activity of the vegetative life day and night and the tree's smooth and luxuriant growth are penetration on the higher level. How can human efforts have any part of it? Therefore, whatever human effort can do and whatever can be talked about represent learning on the lower level. But penetration on the higher level is implicit in learning on the lower level. All that the sage said, although absolutely refined and subtle, is a matter of lower learning. A student should direct his effort to this, and penetration on the higher level will naturally follow. There is no need to seek a separate and distinct way of higher penetration. To hold the will firm is like having a pain in the heart, as the whole mind is concentrated on the pain. How can there be time for idle talk or being a busybody? I asked what efforts are to be made in achieving refinement and singleness of mind. The teacher said, Singleness is the goal of refinement, and refinement is the effort to achieve singleness. It is not that outside of refinement there is another thing called singleness. Since the word refinement, king, has the radical meaning rice, let us take rice as an example. Singleness means having the rice absolutely pure and white. However, this state cannot be achieved without the work of refining, such as winnowing, sifting, and grinding. These are the work of refining, but their purpose is no more than to make rice absolutely pure and white. That is all. To study extensively, to inquire accurately, to think carefully, to sift clearly, and to practice earnestly are all efforts of refinement for the sake of singleness of mind. As to the rest, to study literature extensively is the effort to be restrained by the rules of propriety, to investigate things and to extend knowledge are efforts to make the will sincere, to pursue study and inquiry is the effort to honor one's moral nature, and to manifest goodness is the effort to make the personal life sincere. This is the only way to put it. The teacher said, Knowledge is the beginning of action, and action is the completion of knowledge. Learning to be a sage involves only one effort. Knowledge and action should not be separated. The teacher said, When Confucius advised Chi Tao Kai, 540 to 450 BC, to become an official, the latter said, I do not yet have the confidence to do so. Confucius was pleased. When Zulu 542-480 BC got Zhu Kao appointed governor, uh, born 521, appointed governor of P, Confucius said, you are doing an injury to someone's son. When Tang Tian, father of Tang Zhi, 505 to 436 BC expressed his wish. Confucius gave his approval. From these we can see what the sage had in mind. I asked, when one's mind is preserved in peace and tranquility, can it be called the state of equilibrium before one's feelings are aroused? The teacher said, nowadays when people preserve their mind, only their vital force is calm. When they are peaceful and tranquil, it is only their vital force that is peaceful and tranquil. That cannot be considered as the state of equilibrium before feelings are aroused. If it is not equilibrium, isn't it perhaps the way to achieve it? The only way is to get rid of selfish human desires and preserve the principle of nature. When tranquil, direct every thought to removing selfish human desires and preserving the principle of nature. And when active, direct every thought to doing the same. One should never mind whether or not one is at peace and tranquil. It if he depends on that peace and tranquility, not only will there be the fault of gradually becoming fond of quietness and tired of activity, but there will be many defects latent in that state of mind. They cannot be eliminated, but will grow as usual when something happens. If one regards following principle as fundamental, when is it that one will not be peaceful and tranquil? 
but if one regards peace and tranquility as fundamental, he is not necessarily able to follow principle. I asked, when Confucius's disciples expressed their wishes, Zhu Lu and Chan Cho, 522-462 BC, chose governmental positions and Kong Shi Hua, 509 BC, chose ceremonies and music, how practical they were, but when Tsung Tian expressed his wishes, they seemed to be frivolous, and yet Confucius approved of him. What does it mean? The three other disciples were opinionated and dogmatic. When one is opinionated and dogmatic, one inevitably becomes one-sided. He may be able to do one thing but not the other. The attitude of Tung Tian shows that he was neither opinionated nor dogmatic. It means that he does what is proper to his position and does not want to go beyond it. If he is in the midst of barbarous tribes, he does what is proper in the midst of barbarous tribes. In a position of difficulty and danger, he does what is proper in a position of difficulty and danger. He can find himself in no situation in which he is not at ease with himself. The other three disciples may be described as utensils, that is, specific and therefore limited in their usefulness. Tsung Tian's indication was that he was not such a utensil. Nevertheless, the three disciples' talents were all outstanding and excellent. They were unlike people of today who lack substance but have only empty words. This is why Confucius approved of all of them. I asked, what should one do when he finds no progress in knowledge? The teacher said, in study there must be a source. One must work from the source and gradually move forward. When the Taoist seekers after immortality talk about an infant, it is a good analogy. When the baby is still in the mother's womb, it is only pure material force. What knowledge has it? After its birth, at first it can cry, then it can laugh, then it can recognize its parents and brothers, then it can stand, walk, hold things, and carry things on its back, and finally it can potentially do everything in the world. This is all due to the fact that as refined material force is increasingly sufficient, its strength and energy become increasingly strong and its intelligence becomes increasingly developed. All of this is not to be found or accomplished on the day of birth, therefore there must be a source. When a sage cultivates his moral qualities to such a point as to enable a happy order to prevail throughout heaven and earth and all things to flourish, his training begins with the state of equilibrium before the feelings of pleasure, anger, sorrow, and joy are aroused. Later scholars fail to understand the doctrine of the investigation of things, seeing that the sage knows everything and can do everything. They forthwith want to study everything at the very beginning. How can that be done? teacher said again, to make up one's mind and to exert effort are like planting a tree. At first there are only roots and sprouts, but not yet the trunk. When there is a trunk, there are not yet branches. When there are branches, then come the leaves, and when there are leaves, then come the flowers and fruits. When the root is first planted, one should only care for it and water it, and should not think of branches, leaves, flowers, or fruits. What good is it to engage in fantasy? So long as one does not neglect the care of the plant, there is no fear that there will be no branches, leaves, flowers, or fruits. I asked, I read books and do not understand why. The teacher said, This is because you only seek the meaning through words. This is why you do not understand. This is not as good as to pursue old-style learning. People who pursue old-style learning read the text over and over and understand them. Although they understand the text perfectly, however, to the end of their lives they achieve nothing. One's effort must be directed to the substance of the mind. Whenever one does not understand a thing or cannot put it into practice, one must return to oneself and in his own mind try to realize it personally. He will then surely understand. For what the four books and five classics talk about does not go beyond the substance of the mind. This substance of the mind is the way. When the substance of the mind is understood, the way is understood. They are not two different things. This is the basis of learning. The teacher said, The original mind is vacuous, devoid of selfish desires, intelligent, and not beclouded. All principles are contained therein, and all events proceed from it. There is no principle outside the mind. There is no event outside the mind. 
So it asked, Master Hui An said that man's object of learning is simply mind and principles. What do you think of this saying? The teacher said, The mind is the nature of man and things, and nature is principle. I am afraid the use of the word and makes inevitable the interpretation of mind and principle as two different things. Someone said, All people have this mind, and this mind is identical with principle. Why do some people do good and others do evil? The teacher said, The mind of the evil man has lost its original substance. I asked, Split it, principle, up, and you will find it extremely refined and not confused. Then put it together again, and you will find it extremely great and all-inclusive. What do you think of this saying? The teacher said, I am afraid that is not entirely correct. Does principle permit any splitting up, and what is the need of putting it together again? What the sage said about refinement and singleness of mind, of course, describes it completely. The teacher said, Self-examination is preserving the mind and nourishing the nature while engaged in activity. Preserving the mind and nourishing the nature are self-examination when one is not engaged in activity. I once asked about Lu Xiang Shan, uh, Lu Xiu Yuan, 1139 to 93, doctrine that one should devote one's effort to the area of human feelings and human affairs. The teacher said, there is no event outside of human feelings and human affairs. Are pleasure, anger, sorrow, and joy not human feelings? Seeing, hearing, speaking, and acting, wealth and noble station, poverty and humble station, misfortune, calamity, death, and life are all human affairs. Human affairs are within the realm of human feelings. The important point is to achieve the state of equilibrium and harmony, and achieving equilibrium and harmony depends primarily on being watchful over oneself when alone. I said, humanity, righteousness, propriety, and wisdom are so-called because they express the qualities of the mind after the feelings are aroused. The teacher said, correct. On a later occasion, I said, are the sense of commiseration, the sense of shame and dislike, the sense of def deference and compliance, and the sense of right and wrong manifestation, uh, manifestations of men's nature? The teacher said, humanity... Righteousness, propriety, and wisdom are also manifestations. Nature is one. As physical form or body, it is called nature. As master of the creative process, it is called the Lord. In its universal operation, it is called destiny. An endowment in man, as endowment in man, it is called man's nature. As master of man's body, it is called the mind. When it emanates from the mind, we have filial piety. When it is applied to the father, loyalty when it is applied to the ruler, and so on to affinity. All this is only one nature. Similarly, man is only one. He is called the son with respect to the father, or the father with respect to the son, and so on to affinity. Man is only one. We must direct our effort to our nature. If we distinctly understand what nature is, all the 10,000 principles will become crystal clear. One day, the business of study was discussed. The teacher said, In teaching people, don't insist on a particular, one-sided way. In the beginning, one's mind is like a restless monkey, and his feelings are like a galloping horse. They cannot be tied down. His thoughts and deliberation mostly tend to the side of selfish human desires. At that point, teach him to sit in meditation and to stop those thoughts and deliberation. Wait a long time till his mind becomes somewhat settled. If, however, at this time, he merely remains quiet in a vacuum, like dry wood and dead ashes. It is also useless. Rather, he must be taught self-examination and self-mastery. There is no let-up in this work. It is like getting rid of robbers and thieves. There must be the determination to wipe them out thoroughly and completely. Before things happen, each and every selfish desire for sex, wealth, and fame must be discovered. The root of the trouble must be pulled up and thrown away so that it will never sprout again. Only then can we feel fine. At all times, be like a cat trying to catch a rat, with eyes single-mindedly watching it and ears single-mindedly listening. As soon as an evil thought begins to arise, overcome it and cast it away. Be as decisive as in cutting a nail or 
slicing a piece of iron. Do not tolerate it or give it any consideration. Do not harbor it and do not allow it any way out. Only efforts such as these can be considered serious and concrete. Only then can selfish desires be thoroughly and completely wiped out. When there are no more evil desires to be overcome, one will then automatically arrive at the state of a king who merely folds his hands and sits erect. Although, what is there to think about, what is there to deliberate about, is not the business of a beginner who must be thinking of self-examination and self-mastery, that is, of sincerity. One has only to think of the principle of nature. When the mind becomes completely identified with the principle of nature, that is the state of what is there to think about, what is there to deliberate about. I asked, someone is afraid of evil spirits at night, how about it? The teacher said, this is because in his daily life he has not accumulated righteousness, and his mind is timid about something. That is why he is afraid. If his ordinary conduct is in harmony with the gods, what has he to fear? Ma Zhe Xin said, one need not be afraid of upright spirits. I am afraid, however, that evil spirits pay no attention to whether a man has done right or wrong. Consequently, one cannot but be afraid. The teacher said, can an evil spirit delude an upright man? This fear itself shows that the mind is not upright. Therefore, if anyone is deluded, it is not any spirit that deludes him. He is deluded by his own mind. For example, if a man is fond of sex, it means that the spirit of lust has deluded him. If he is fond of money, it means that the spirit of money has deluded him. When he is angry at something at which he should not be angry, it means that the spirit of anger has deluded him. And when he is afraid of something which he should not be afraid, it means that it means the spirit of fear has deluded him. The teacher said, Calmness is the original substance of the mind. It is the principle of nature. It is the state in which activity and tranquility are united. I asked about the similarity and difference between the great learning and the doctrine of the mean. The teacher said, Zhe Su, 492 to 431, incorporated the fundamental ideas of the great learning in the first chapter of the Doctor of the Mean. I asked, when Zhu Lu asked Confucius what he would do first of all if he were to serve under the ruler of Wei, who was then actually hoping that Confucius would do so, Confucius replied that the first thing was the rectification of names, that is, a son should be a true son, etc. A former scholar said that since the heir apparent of Wei, Kwai Wai, attempted matricide and had to flee, and since his own son, Cha, who was eventually made the duke, opposed his return to Wei, both as sons were not true to the name of a son, and Confucius being true to his doctrine of the rectification of names, would report to the Son of Heaven above and inform the regional feudal lords below, remove Cha, and put the original ruler's son, younger son, Ying, in his place. What is the meaning of this? The teacher said, This, I am afraid, would be difficult to do. Is it correct that when a ruler shows his respect and extends his courtesy to the utmost in waiting for a person to serve in his government, the first thing the person should do is to remove the ruler it, it is uh, is this in conformity with human feelings and the principle of nature since confucius was willing to serve under cha it must have been that cha was wholeheartedly trusted confucius with all the affairs of the state and listened to his advice that the sage with his imminent virtue and perfect sincerity had influenced and transformed him making him realize that none could be counted a man who refused to recognize his father, and that Cho would surely cry bitterly and run to welcome his father back. Love of father and son is based on heaven-endowed human nature. If Cho could truly repent like this, could Kwai Wai fail to be moved and delighted by a good deed? When Kwai Wai had returned, Cho would forthwith entrust the state to him and beg to be punished by death. Since Kwai Wai would then have been influenced by his son, 
And furthermore, since Grandmaster Confucius, with, with his perfect sincerity, would have mediated, the father would surely decline to accept, but would order Cha to continue to rule. All the ministers and the people would then surely want to have Cha as the ruler. Cha, on the other hand, would voluntarily reveal his own sin, petition the Son of Heaven, and inform the feudal lords of regions and states, and insist on entrusting the state to his father. At the same time, Kwai Wai, all the ministers, and the people would also publicize the excellence of Cha's repentance, humanity, and filial piety, petition the Son of Heaven, and inform the feudal lords of regions and states, and insisting on having Cha as their ruler. Consequently, the mandate of Heaven to rule would center on Cha, ordering him to serve again as the ruler of the state of Wei. Cha would have no recourse except to do as the Grand Emperor of a later age. When the Emperor Kaozu honored his father with the title of Grand Emperor in 201 BC, lead all the ministers and the people to honor Kwai Wai as the Grand Duke, make ample provision for his support, and then step back and resume his position. In that way, according to the Confucian doctrine that the ruler should be a true ruler, the minister a true minister, the father a true father, and the son a true son. The names would be correct and language would be in accord with the truth of things. And then in one stroke one would be able to govern the world. The meaning of Confucius's doctrine of the rectification of names is perhaps this. While I was temporarily living in the Bureau of State Ceremonials, I unexpectedly received a letter saying that my son was seriously ill. My sorrow was unbearable. The teacher said, This is the time for you to exert effort. If you allow this occasion to go by, what is the use of studying when nothing is happening? People should train and polish themselves at just such a time as this. A father's love for his son is, of course, the noblest of feeling. Nevertheless, in the operation of the principle of nature, there is the proper degree of equilibrium and harmony. To be excessive means to give rein to selfish thoughts. On such an occasion, most people feel that according to the principle of nature they should be sorrowful. Thus they keep on with sorrow and distress. They do not realize that they are already affected by worries and anxieties and their minds will not be correct. Generally speaking, the influence of the seven emotions is in the majority of cases excessive and only in the minority of cases insufficient. As soon as it is excessive, it is not in accord with the original substance of the mind. It must be adjusted to reach the mean before it becomes correct. Take the case of the death of parents. Is it not true that the son desires to mourn until death before he feels satisfied? Nevertheless, it is said, the self-inflicted suffering should not be carried out to such an extent as to destroy life. Book of Rights it is not that the sage tries to restrict or suppress it. It is because the original substance of the principle of nature has its proper limits that should not be exceeded. People need only to understand the substance of the mind, and then automatically not an iota can be added to or subtracted from it. The teacher said, It should not be said that all ordinary persons have attained the state of equilibrium before the feelings are aroused. For a substance and function come from one source. Given the substance, there is the function, and given the equilibrium before the feelings are aroused, there is the harmony in which the feelings are aroused and all attain due measure and degree. Since people of today do not possess this harmony, accordingly we should know that they have not completely attained equilibrium. The teacher said, the explanation of change in the sentence in the first nine of the lowest line of the hexagram, which is symbolic of the positive element, yang, one sees its subject as the dragon, which is also symbolic of yang, lying in the deep and therefore one should lie low and be on guard, for it is not the time for action. The symbol is not the dragon, as former theories have held, but the lowest line. The operation of change is not to be found elsewhere, but right in the line itself in accordance with which changes take place.
tell of fortune or misfortune according to the change. It's not the use the dragon, not to use the dragon as the symbol and merely the phrase, not the time for action as the explanation, but to use the whole sentence as explanation. Teacher said, the phrase, the restorative power of the knight refers to ordinary people. If a student can apply his efforts, then whatever does or does not happen in the daytime is an occasion for this power to gather and to grow. As for the sage, it is unnecessary to talk about the restorative power of the knight. I asked about the chapter saying, hold it fast and you preserve it, let it go and you lose it. The teacher said, although when the passage adds that it goes out and comes in at no definite time and without anyone's knowing its direction, it refers to the mind of the common man. The student must realize that the original substance of the mind is basically like this. The effort of holding fast and preserving the mind is then free from any defects. One should not readily say that when the mind goes out, it is lost, and when it comes in, it is preserved. If we talk about the original substance, in fact, it neither goes out nor comes in. If we talk about going out and coming in, then the mind's thoughts deliberations and operations are the going out. However, the master is always obviously present. Where is there any going out? And if there is no going out, where is there any coming in? When Master Chung Hao, Chung Min Tao, 1032 to 85, talked about the hollow place that fills the whole body, he referred to nothing other than the principle of nature. Although one may be engaged in social intercourse all day long, if he is not able to depart from the principle of nature, it is tantamount to his remaining inside this body. Only when he departs from the principle of nature can he be said to have let the mind go or lost it. He again said, To go out or come in is no more than activity and tranquility. Neither activity nor tranquility has any beginning. Do they have any direction? Wang Cha Xiu asked, the Buddhists lure people into their way of life by the promise of escape from the cycle of life and death, and the Taoists who seek immortality do so with the promise of everlasting life, but in their hearts they do not wish people to do evil. In the final analysis, they also see the upper section of the way of the sage, but the paths to attainment are not correct. It is like the ways of becoming an official today. Some attain positions through civil service examinations, some through recommendations by local officials, and some through connections with palace officials. They all become high officials, but after all, these are not the proper ways of becoming officials, and the superior man does not follow them. Reduced to fundamentals, the Buddhists and Taoists are somewhat similar to the Confucians. However, they have only the upper section and neglect the lower section, and in the end are not as perfect as the sage. Nevertheless, we cannot deny that they are similar in the upper section. On the other hand, Confucians of later generations have only the lower section of the sage's doctrine. They mutilated it and lost its true nature and degenerated into the four schools of recitation and memorization, the writing of flowery compositions, the pursuit of success and profit, and textual criticism and thus at bottom are no different from the heterodox schools. People of these four schools work hard throughout their lives and benefit their bodies and minds not a bit. They seem to compare unfavorably with the Buddhists and Taoists, whose minds are pure, whose desires are few, and who are free from the worldly bondage of fame and profit. Nowadays, students need not, first of all, attack Taoism and Buddhism. Rather, they should earnestly fix their determination on the doctrine of the sage, as the doctrine of this sage is made clear to the world, Buddhism and Taoism will disappear of themselves. Otherwise, I am afraid what we want to learn will not be considered worthwhile by Buddhists and Taoists. In that case, would it not be difficult to expect them to condescend and come to our fold? This is my humble opinion. What do you think of it, sir? The teacher said, what you have said is essentially correct as to what are called the upper section and the lower section. They are one-sided points of view. The way of the sage is the great mean and perfect correctness, penetrating both the higher and the lower levels, being one thread that runs through all. What is there to be called the upper section or the lower section? The successive movement of the active element yang and the passive element yin constitutes the way. 
The man of humanity sees it and calls it humanity. The man of wisdom sees it and calls it wisdom. And the common people act according to it daily without knowing it. In this way, the way of the superior man is fully realized. Should humanity or wisdom not be called the way? Only if one's view of it is one-sided will there be trouble. The teacher said, the use of stalks of plants for divination is, of course, a system of finding out the operation of the change, but the use of tortoise shells is also a system of the change. I said, Confucius said that King Wu was not perfectly good. It seems that Confucius was not satisfied with him. The teacher said, Under the circumstances, King Wu could not have been otherwise. I said, if King Wen had not died, what would have happened? The teacher said, before King Wen died, the house of Cho had already possessed two-thirds of the empire. If King Wen had been alive when King Wu sent a military expedition to punish King Cho of Shang, he probably would not have resorted to military force. Certainly, the remaining third would have come and submitted to him. King Wen would have handled King Cho skillfully so that he would not have indulged in evil. That is all. I asked about Mincius saying, holding the mean without allowing for special circumstances is like holding on to one particular thing. The teacher said, the mean is nothing but the principle of nature it is the change. It changes according to the time. How can one hold it fast? One must act according to the circumstance. It is difficult to fix a pattern of action in advance. Later scholars insist on describing principles in their minute details, leaving out nothing, and prescribing a rigid pattern for action. This is the exact meaning of holding on to one particular thing. Tang Xu asked, Does making up the mind mean retaining good thought at all times and wanting to do good and remove evil? The teacher said, When a good thought is retained, there is the principle of nature. The thought itself is goodness. Is there another goodness to be thought about? Since the thought is not evil, what evil is there to be removed? This thought is comparable to the root of a tree. To make up one's mind means always to build up this good thought, that is all. To be able to follow what one's heart desires without transgressing moral principles merely means that one's mind has reached full maturity. The teacher said, Generally speaking, the fundamental principle should be that of collecting and concentrating one's spirit, moral character, speech, and action. Only under unavoidable circumstances that they be allowed to be diffused. This is true of man, heaven, earth, and things. I asked what sort of person Wen Chung Tzu was. The teacher said, he can just about be described as complete in all respects, but not great. It is regrettable that he died young. I asked, then why has he been criticized for imitating the classics by writing supplements to them? The teacher said, it is not entirely wrong to imitate the classics. Please explain. After a long while, the teacher said, I realize all the more that the mind of an expert is singularly distressed, for he is likely to be misunderstood. This is a sentiment from a poem by Tu Fu. Xu Lu Chai, Xu Hong, 1209-81. Uh, so, Xu Lu Chai's theory that the first thing a scholar should do is to secure a livelihood is harmful. I asked about the concepts of the prime force, the prime spirit, and the prime essence of those Taoists who seek after immortality. The teacher said, they are all one. In its universal operation, it is force. In its condensation and concentration, it is essence. 
and in its wonderful function in the spirit. The teacher said, the original substance of pleasure, anger, sorrow, and joy is naturally in the states of equilibrium and harmony. As soon as one attaches a bit of his own idea to them, they will become excessive or deficient. They will be selfish. I asked about Confucius not singing on the day of mourning when he wept. The teacher said, because of the substance of the sage's mind, he was naturally like this. The teacher said, in trying to master oneself, every selfish thought must be thoroughly and completely wiped out without leaving even an iota. If an iota remains, many evils will come one leaving the other. I asked about the Lu Lu Xin Shu new book on pitch pipes. The teacher said the student should be earnestly devoted to what is of the greatest importance. Even if one becomes thoroughly familiar with these calculations, they may not necessarily be of any use. It is necessary that the mind should first possess the fundamental of ceremonies and music. For example, according to the book, usually a series of pitch pipes is used for the twelve semitones filled with reed ashes buried in the ground in an enclosed room with one end of the pipe exposed, and we then wait for the response of material force to the weather to determine the correct pitch. If the ashes in the tube fly off at the proper time of its corresponding month, it will show that material force responds to the proper weather, and the pitch will therefore be correct. For example, when the ashes fly off during the first two-hour period of the winter solstice, the pitch for the fundamental tone, approximately F, is correct. But at the winter solstice, the ashes may fly off just a moment earlier or later. How can we know to what moment of the winter solstice the pipe should correspond? We must first understand in our mind what the exact moment of the winter solstice should be. This is where the book does not make sense. The student must first direct his effort to acquiring the fundamentals of ceremonies and music. Xu Ai said, the mind is like a mirror, the sage's mind is like a clear mirror, whereas that of the ordinary person is like a dull mirror. The theory of the investigation of themes in recent times says that it works like a mirror reflecting themes, and the effort is to be directed toward the passive role of reflecting. They don't realize that the mirror is still dull. How can it reflect? The investigation of themes in our teacher's theory is like polishing the mirror to make it clear. The effort is to be directed toward the active role of polishing. When the mirror is clear, it does not cease to reflect. I asked about the refinement or coarseness of the way. The teacher said, The way is neither refined nor coarse. It is so only from man's point of view. Take this room. When a person at first comes in, he sees only a large form. After some time, he sees clearly that the columns, the walls, and so forth, one by one. Still later, he sees minute details, such as ornaments on the columns, if there are any. But the room is just a room. The teacher said, When we have seen each other in recent days, you gentlemen have not asked many questions. Why? If a person does not exert effort, he would think that he already knows the way of learning and that all he has to do is to follow it out in action. He does not realize that one's selfish desires grow day by day, like dirt piling up on the ground. If for one day it is not swept out, another layer will be accumulated. If one exerts serious and concrete effort, 
you will see that the way is infinite. The more one reaches for it, the deeper it becomes. In pursuing the way, one must be as thorough as in grinding rice until it is refined and white, without neglecting the least bit. I asked, only after knowledge has been extended to the utmost can we talk about the sincerity of the will. Now since we do not yet know all about the principle of nature and selfish human desires, how can we exert any effort on self-mastery? The teacher said, if a person exerts effort with all seriousness and with personal concern, and does so without stop, he will gradually day by day see the refinement and subtlety of the principle nature in his mind. He will also gradually, day by day, see the minuteness and subtlety of selfish desires in his mind. If he does not exert the effort of self-mastery, that all day long he does nothing but talk. The principle of nature never reveals itself, nor do selfish desires. It is like walking on the road to go somewhere. As one walks one section of the road, he recognizes the next section. When he comes to a fork, and is in doubt, he will ask and then go on. Only then can he gradually reach his destination. People today are not willing to preserve as much of the principle of nature as they already know, nor to get rid of the selfish human desires they already know, but merely worry about not knowing all of them. They just talk idly. What good is it? Let one wait till he has mastered himself to the point of having no more selfish desires to overcome and then worry about not knowing all. It will still not be too late. I asked, the way is one. In discussing it, the ancients often disagreed. Are there some essential points about searching for it? The teacher said, the way has neither spatial restrictions nor physical form and it cannot be penned down to any particular. To seek it by confining ourselves to literal meaning would be far off the mark. Take those people today who talk about heaven. Do they actually understand it? It is incorrect to say that the sun, the moon, wind, and thunder constitute heaven. It is also incorrect to say that man, animals, and plants do not constitute it. Heaven is the way. If we realize this, where is the way not to be found? People merely look at it from one corner and conclude that the way is nothing but this or that. Consequently, they disagree. If one knows how to search for the way inside the mind and to see the substance of one's own mind, then there is no place nor time where the way is not to be found. It pervades the past and present and is without beginning or end. Where do similarity and difference come in? The mind is the way, and the way is heaven. If one knows the mind, he knows both the way and heaven. He again said, if you gentlemen want to understand the way definitely, you must personally realize it in your own mind without depending on any search outside. Only then will it be all right. I asked, should names, varieties, and systems of things be investigated first of all? The teacher said, it is necessary only for a person fully to realize the substance of his own mind, and then its functions will be found right in its midst. If one should nourish the substance of his mind so that there is really equilibrium before the feelings are aroused, then naturally when they are aroused they will attain harmony in due measure and degree and wherever it may be applied, it will be correct. On the other hand, if there is no such mind, even if one may have gone into many names, varieties, and systems of things, they really have nothing to do with him, but are merely ornaments. Naturally, when the time comes to use them, they are of no use. I do not mean to neglect the names, varieties, and systems completely. I merely point out that if we know that first things must come first, then we can approach the way. He again said, one must accomplish according to his ability. Ability is what one can do. Like the ability of Kwe, 
Emperor Shan's minister to institute musical systems and the ability of Shan's minister Chu to institute agriculture. These were the original endowments of their nature. Their accomplishment was due to the fact that the substance of their minds became completely identified with the principle of nature, so that whatever its function might be, it issued from the principle of nature. Only this can be called ability. When the point is reached that the mind becomes completely identified with the principle of nature, one's ability is not restricted to any particular thing. If Kui and Chu had exchanged places, they would have been able to accomplish each other's tasks also. He again said, Take, for example, the superior man. In a position of wealth and in noble station, he does what is proper to a position of wealth and to noble station. In a position of difficulty and danger, he does what is proper to a position of difficulty and danger. In all these, he is not restricted to any particular thing. Only those who have correctly nourished the substance of their mind can do so. The teacher said, It is better to be a small body of water in a well which comes from a spring than a large body of water in a pond which comes from no source. The water in the well has the spirit of life that is inexhaustible. It is said that when the teacher said so, he was sitting by a well next to a pond. Therefore, he used this analogy to enlighten his students. I asked, Civilization declines further and further. How can we see the condition of great antiquity again? The teacher said, A single day is no different from a period of 129,600 years. When one gets up early in the morning and sits down, he has not yet come into contact with the influence of the material world. His mind is pure and clear, and this condition makes him feel as though he is living at the time of Fushi of great antiquity. I asked, When the mind is inclined to chase after material things, what can be done? The teacher said, when a ruler folds his arms, sits erect, and is at leisure and at peace, and each of his chief ministers attends to his duties, the state will be in order. The mind should command the five sense organs in the same way. But if when the eye wants to see, the mind itself pursues the color, or when the ear wants to hear, the mind itself pursues the sound. It will be as though a ruler himself occupied the position of the minister of personnel when he wanted officials selected or the position of the minister of military affairs when he wanted an army transferred. When he does so, not only is the true nature of a ruler gone, the six departments cannot function either. The teacher said, When a good thought arises, recognize it and develop it fully. When an evil thought arises, recognize it and stop it. It is the will that recognizes the thought and develops or stops it. It is the intelligence that is innate knowledge of the good endowed by heaven. This is all a sage has. The student must preserve it. I said, the love of sex, wealth, and fame is, of course, selfish desire. But why are idle and sundry thoughts also regarded as selfish desires? The teacher said, In the final analysis they grow from such roots as the love of sex, wealth, and fame. You will see if you get at the root. You surely know in your own mind that you have no thought of stealing. Why? Because at bottom you do not have such thought. If you eliminate all thoughts of sex, wealth, and fame, and so forth. Just as you have no thought of becoming a thief, there will be nothing but the original substance of the mind. What idle thoughts can there be? This pure state is the state of absolute quiet and inactivity. In the Book of Changes. The equilibrium before the feelings are aroused. From the doctrine of the mean and broad and extremely impartial from Chang Hao. The natural effect will be that 
When acted on, he immediately penetrates all things. From the book of changes. When the feelings are aroused, each and all attain due degree and measure. From the doctrine of the moon. And it responds spontaneously to all things as they come. John Howard again. So again, what idle thoughts can there be? This pure state is the state of absolute quiet and inactivity, the equilibrium before the feelings are aroused, and broad and extremely impartial. The natural effect will be that, when acted on, it immediately penetrates all things. When the feelings are aroused, each and all attain to degree and measure, and it responds spontaneously to all things as they come. I asked about the will is the highest and the vital force comes next. The teacher said, it means that wherever the will goes, so does the vital force. It does not mean that the will is the ultimate chief, whereas the vital force is subordinate to it. If the will is head for, held firm, the vital force will also be properly cultivated and nourished. And if no violence is done to vital force, the will will also be held firm. Mencius corrected Kaus's mistake of being one-sided and therefore emphasized both the nature and the will equally. I asked, a former scholar said, the sage necessarily takes his doctrine down to a low position so people can approach it, while a worthy lifts his words to a higher position so the doctrine of the sage may be respected. What do you think of it? The teacher said, It is wrong. To do so would be insincere. The sage is comparable to heaven. It is everywhere, up where the sun, moon, and stars are. It is heaven and deep down underground it is also heaven. When has heaven descended to a lower position? The sage is one who is great and is completely transformed to be goodness itself. A worthy may be compared to a high mountain peak. He has only to maintain this lofty position. But a mountain of 1,000 feet cannot stretch to become 10,000 feet, and a mountain of 10,000 feet cannot stretch to become 100,000 feet. The worthy does not extend himself to achieve a lofty position. To do so would be insincere. I asked Chung Yi, said that we should not seek equilibrium before the feelings of pleasure, anger, sorrow, and joy are aroused. Yen Ping, Li Tong, 1088-1158, however, taught people to watch for the disposition before such feelings are aroused. What do you say about them? The teacher said, they are both right. Chung Yi was afraid lest people seek equilibrium before the feelings are aroused, regarded equilibrium as separate and distinct, like what I previously described as trying to attain equilibrium after one's vital force is calmed down. He therefore told people to make the effort of seeking equilibrium right in self-cultivation and self-examination. Yen Ping, on the other hand, was afraid lest people have no place to start. He therefore told them at all times to look for the disposition before the feelings are aroused. He wanted them to direct all their attention to this condition when they open their eyes directly to look or turn their ears attentively to listen. This is the work of not waiting to see things before becoming cautious or to hear things before becoming apprehensive. In both cases, the teachers of the past could not help teaching people in the ways they did. I asked, ordinary people of course do not possess the totality of equilibrium before the feelings of pleasure, anger, sorrow, and joy are aroused and of harmony after they are aroused, but suppose there is a small matter that should arouse one's pleasure or anger, 
If ordinarily he does not have the mind of pleasure or anger, and when the matter occurs he can also attain a due measure and degree of pleasure or anger, can that be called the state of equilibrium and harmony? The teacher said, He may be said to attain equilibrium and harmony in connection with a particular affair or occasion, but cannot be said to have acquired the great foundation or to be following the universal way. The nature of all men is good. They all originally possessed the qualities of equilibrium and harmony. How can we say that they are without them? However, since the mind of the ordinary man is obscured and darkened to some extent, although its original substance reveals itself from time to time, nevertheless it appears one moment and disappears the next. It is not the mind in its total substance and great functioning. Only when the mind attains equilibrium at all times can it be said to have a great foundation, and only when it attains harmony at all times can it be said to be following the universal way. Only those who are perfectly sincere can establish the great foundation for humanity. I said, I still do not understand the meaning of equilibrium. The teacher said, it must be personally realized in one's own mind cannot be explained in words. Equilibrium is nothing but the principle of nature. What is the principle of nature? One recognizes it when he has gotten rid of selfish human desires. Why is the principle of nature called equilibrium? Because it is balanced and impartial. What is the condition of that? It is like a bright mirror. It is entirely clear without a speck of dust attached to it. To be partial is to be attached. When one is attached to the love of sex, wealth, fame, and so forth, it is clear that he is unbalanced. However, before the feelings are aroused, the mind is not yet attached to the love of sex, wealth, fame, and so forth. How can we know that it is unbalanced? Although there is not yet any attachment, nevertheless, in one's everyday life, one's mind is not entirely free from such love. Since it is not free from it, it means that it is present in the mind. This being so, it cannot be said that the mind is not partial. Take a person sick with intermittent fever. Although at times the illness does not appear, so long as the root of the disease has not been eliminated, a person cannot be said to be free from the disease. Only when all such selfish desires as the love for sex, wealth, fame, and so forth in one's daily life are completely wiped out and cleaned up, so that not the least bit is retained, and the mind becomes broad in its total substance, and becomes completely identified with the principle of nature. Can it be said to have attained equilibrium before the feelings are aroused and to have acquired the great foundation of virtue? I asked, you said that after Yen Hui, Confucius's favorite pupil, passed away, the doctrine of the sage died out. I cannot help being dubious about that. Yen Hui alone understood the way of the sage in its entirety. You can see that from the fact that he heaved a sigh. When he said, the master, by good order, skillfully leads a man along and teaches him, he taught me to broaden myself with literature and restrain myself with rules of propriety. He said so after he had thoroughly understood the way, how skillful it is in leading and teaching people to broaden them with literature and restrain them with rules of propriety. The student must think it over. It was difficult even for the sage to tell people about the way in its total reality. The student must study and come to understand by himself. When Yen Hui wished to follow the way but could not find it, he said so in the same spirit of humility and devotion as King Wen, who looked for the way as if he could not see it. I believe that to look for the way as if one cannot see it is to see it perfectly. Since Yen Hui's death, the orthodox doctrine of the sage has not continued in its totality. I asked, The mind is the master of the body. Knowledge is the intelligence of the mind. The will is knowledge in operation. 
and the thing is that to which the will is directed. Is this correct? The teacher said, generally correct. The teacher said, to preserve one's mind and see to it that it is always present is itself learning. What is the use of thinking of past and future events? In doing so, one merely loses his mind. The teacher said, when one speaks without proper order, we can see that his mind is not preserved. Shui Shang Chen asked, Does the unperturbed mind Mencius talked about differ from that of Kaozu? The teacher said, Kaozu forcefully controlled his mind and kept it from being perturbed. Mencius, on the other hand, accumulated righteousness to the point where the mind naturally is unperturbed. The teacher added, In its original substance, the mind is not perturbed. The original substance of the mind is one's nature and one's nature is principle. Both human nature and principle are originally unperturbed. The accumulation of righteousness means returning to the original substance of the mind. The teacher said, At the time when all things are luxuriantly present, reality is also empty, tranquil, and without any sign. And when reality is empty, tranquil, and without any sign, it is the same as when all things are luxuriously present. The state of being empty, tranquil, and without any sign is the father of singleness. For all things are produced from this state, and the state of all things being luxuriantly present is the mother of refinement, since all things embrace principle. Singleness involves refinement, and refinement involves singleness. The teacher said, There is no thing or event outside the mind. For instance, when a thought rises in my mind to serve my parents filially, then serving my parents filially is a thing or event. The teacher said, nowadays people who pursue what I call the learning of the investigation of things still, for the most part, fall into mere talking and listening. How much less can those who pursue learning by talking and listening return to the investigation of things? The refinement and subtlety of the principle of nature and selfish human desires are such that one must make a constant effort at self-examination and self-mastery before he can gradually see it. Now if one just talks, even though he talks only about the principle of nature without his realizing it, there is already in his mind, even for a short moment, a certain amount of selfish desire, for it does secretly arise without our knowing it. It is not easy to discover even if one examines it with great effort. How can one expect to know all by merely talking? Now if we merely talk about the principle of nature, leave it there and do not follow it, and talk about selfish human desires, leave them there and do not get rid of them, is that the learning of the investigation of things and the extension of knowledge? Even at its best, the learning of later generations has only reached its point of achievement through incidental acts of righteousness. I asked about the investigation of things. The teacher said, to investigate, co, is to rectify. It is to rectify that which is incorrect, so it can return to its original correctness. I said, abiding by the highest good means to know that the highest good is inherent in my mind and originally not outside. Only then can the will be calm. The teacher said, right. I asked, the time to exert effort to investigate things is the time when one is active, is that correct? The teacher said, it makes no difference whether one is active or tranquil. There are also things when one is tranquil. Mencius said, always be doing something. Thus one is always doing something whether one is active or tranquil. The teacher said, the difficult part of our effort lies entirely in the investigation of things and the extension of knowledge. This is precisely the matter of the sincerity of the will. If the will is sincere, then to a large extent, the mind is naturally rectified, and the personal life is also naturally cultivated. However, effort is also required to rectify the mind and cultiva cultivate the personal life. The cultivation of the personal life is the part after the feelings are aroused, 
whereas the rectification of the mind is the part before the feelings are aroused. If the mind is rectified, there will be equilibrium. If the personal life is cultivated, there will be harmony. The teacher said, The various steps from the investigation of things and the extension of knowledge to bring the bringing of peace to the world are nothing but manifesting the clear character. Even loving the people is also a matter of manifesting the clear character. The clear character is the character of the mind. It is humanity. The man of humanity regards heaven and earth and all things as one body. If a single thing is deprived of its place, it means that my humanity is not yet demonstrated to the fullest extent. The teacher said, merely to talk about manifesting the clear character and not to talk about loving the people would be to behave like the Taoists and Buddhists. The teacher said, the highest good is the nature. Originally, the nature has not the least evil. Therefore, it is called the highest good. To abide by it is simply to recover the nature's original state. I asked, if one knows that the highest good is his nature, that his nature is completely contained in his mind, and that his mind is where the highest good abides, then he will not seek it outside in a confused manner as in the past, and his will will be calm. Being calm, it will not be disturbed. Not being disturbed, it will be tranquil. Being tranquil, it will not act foolishly and will then be in peaceful repose. To be in peaceful repose is to concentrate the mind and the will right there, right here. In all the thousands and thousands of thoughts, the desire is surely to achieve this highest good. This means he can deliberate and the end can be attained. Is this theory correct? The teacher said, it is generally correct. I said, Master Chung Hao said that the man of humanity regards heaven, earth, and all things as one body. How is it that Moses, 479, 438 BC, doctrine of universal love is not considered one of humanity? The teacher said, it is very difficult to say. You gentlemen must find it out through personal realization. Humanity is the principle of unceasing production and reproduction, although it is prevalent and extensive, and there is no place where it does not exist. Nevertheless, there is an order in its operation and growth. That is why it is unceasing in production and reproduction. For example, at the winter solstice, the first yang grows. Act active cosmic force. There must be the growth of this first yang before all the six stages of yang, the six months between December and June, gradually grow. If there were not the first yang, could there be all the six? It is the same with the yin. Because there is order, so there is a starting point. Because there is a starting point, so there is growth. And because there is growth, it is unceasing, like a tree, for example. When in the beginning it puts forth a shoot, there is the starting point of the tree's spirit of life. After the root appears, the trunk grows. After the trunk grows, branches and leaves come. And then the process of unceasing production and reproduction has begun. If there is no sprout, how can there be the trunk, branches, or leaves? The tree can sprout because there is the root beneath. With the root, the plant will grow. Without it, the plant will die. But without the root, how can it sprout? The love between father and son, elder brother and younger brother, is the starting point of the human mind, spirit of life, just like the sprout of the tree. From here it is extended to humaneness to all people and love to all things. It is just like the growth of the trunk, branches, and leaves. 
Moses' universal love makes no distinction in human relations and regards one's own father, son, elder brother, or younger brother as being the same as a passerby. That means that Moses' universal love has no starting point. It does not sprout. We therefore know that it has no root and that it is not a process of unceasing production and reproduction. How can it be called humanity? Filial piety and brotherly respect are the root of humanity. This means that the principle of humanity grows from within. I asked, Li Yanping said, Be in accord with principle and have no selfish mind. What is the difference between being in accord with principle and having no selfish mind? Jisha said, The mind is principle. To have no selfish mind is to be in accord with principle. And not to be in accord with principle is to have a selfish mind. I am afraid it is not good to speak of the mind and principle as separate. I asked further, the Buddhists are internally free from all kinds of selfishness of lust in the world and thus appear not to have a selfish mind, but externally they discard human relations and thus do not appear to be in accord with principle. The teacher said, these are the same kind of thing, all building up a mind of selfishness.